One of these is a codfish, one of these is a cusk. In the supermarket, both of these meats are just going to be white fish. Are you getting the cod you paid for, or are you getting cusk? How will you tell the difference? The secret is in understanding how pH affects the charge on amino acids. So today, in our lecture supplement, we're going to be talking about amino acids and their ionization in water at different pH values. So grab the slides that move along with this and follow along with me. So first I have some questions for you. Imagine you've got a solution and you have set the pH to 7.0. If you had a molecule in that solution, is it in its basic form or its acidic form? Anything that can be ionized might have an extra proton and be positively charged, might be neutral, or maybe it's lost a proton and is now negatively charged. Which is it? So understanding the charge on amino acids at various pH values is going to be important. Are they charged? And what is the charge? And of course, if a biomolecule is charged, we might be able to use that to separate them from other biomolecules. If they've got different charges, we will be able to separate them. And pH can affect the properties in biochemistry. Certainly in the active site, uh, whether something is in its protonated form or not will change whether or not the active site is in its active form or not. So understanding how acid conditions affect structure and function in biochemistry is important. Another thing to remember is that in chemistry, we think of acids as acids and we think of everything as acids. Even something you might consider to be basic, like this amine, I would think of as an acid that gives up its proton to become the basic form. And then all of our equilibria, every single equilibrium we talk about is an acid equilibrium. What is the equilibrium for this acetic acid pushing that proton onto water? It's 10 to the minus 47, that's the equilibrium constant to make the negatively charged acetate and the hydronium ion, that H plus is on water. What is the equilibrium constant for ammonium pushing a proton onto water? Much less, because we think of ammonia as basic. We don't think of ammonia as uh, you know, giving up a proton, we think of it as taking one. So there, look, it took one to become the positive charge. But in chemistry, we are always going to consider acid going to the basic form. Everything's a Ka. We will never use Kb in this course. So the Ka of acetic acid is 10 to the minus 5. The Ka of ammonium is 10 to the minus 10. That means it is far less likely that an ammonium will have given up its proton in water at pH 7 compared to acetic acid. Now, pKa is an important concept. pKa is the negative log of the Ka value, and it's 4.7. Whenever someone says the pKa is 4.7, what they really mean is the Ka is a small number, it's 10 to the minus 4.7. If someone says the pKa is 10, what they mean is it's an even smaller number, it's 10 to the minus 10. So a pKa is a way of expressing Ka on a log scale and just eliminating the negative sign for simplicity. When you're considering all of this, remember the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. We will know the pH. You set that, didn't you? You're in charge of this experiment. We will know the pKa because that's just on a list of tables. That's a known value for most amino well for all amino acids. The only thing we don't know is whether it's in its acid form or its basic form and what the ratio is. There's the acid form. Here's the basic form. Is it 10 to 1? In which case, this number would be 10. Is it 1 to 10? In which case, A over HA would be 0.1. So if you know this ratio, you could determine the pH if you knew the pKa. If you knew this ratio, you could determine the pKa if you know the pH. If you know the pH and the pKa, you should know what this ratio would be. So review that. And the key to all of this is the log key on your calculator. So we'll be practicing this, but remember, the log key in science is your friend. Make sure you know how to use it. All right. Let's move on. So here is the amino acid alanine. This is alanine at pH 7. It's in its zwitterionic form. The pKa of an acetic acid here is 2.3. At pH 7, it would have given up its proton and be in the basic form as shown. The pKa of this ammonium is 9.7. At pH 7, it would still be in 
its acidic form. pH 7 is not basic enough to significantly deprotonate ammonium. So this is in the Zwitter ionic form, and it is overall neutral. So let's check the pH here. The pH is 7. And of course, we could predict that it was somewhere between 2.3 and 9.7 because both of these groups were ionized. So at neutral pH, acidic groups tend to be in their basic form because they gave up their proton. Basic groups tend to be in their acidic form because they're more basic than neutral and took the proton. Here is aspartic acid. At pH 7, I would expect that the acid groups have given up their protons. That has an acidic pKa, that has an acidic pKa. This is basic and it kept the proton. In neutral conditions, basic groups keep their protons and are in their acidic form, and acidic groups give up their protons and they're in the basic form. Really, if you think about it, uh, a pKa of 2.1 is more acidic than a pH of 7, so it gave up the proton. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Here is lysine, and as you might expect, that at pH 7, the ammonium group at the end of the side chain is in its acidic form. Because it's basic, it held onto that proton in neutral conditions. Now, we really don't care about the head group of amino acids. We don't care about that carboxylic acid or the amine that are attached to the alpha carbon. The key for proteins, because uh, the head group will be involved in the amide backbone, the key for proteins is the side chain. So we need to develop a sort of an instinct, a skill, if you will, through practice of being quickly able to determine if a side chain group is protonated or not at a particular pH value. All right, let's consider this aspartate here. I'm gonna get my pH meter in here. And what we're gonna do is I'm going to put this amino acid into very acidic conditions. We are now at pH one-ish. And at pH one, you'll notice that in strong acidic conditions, the conditions are strongly acidic enough to keep acidic groups in their acid form. This carboxylic acid group is not acidic enough to push back against a pH of one. So this would be like 95% in its acidic form. Um, so everything here is protonated. Everything is, is, in a, is in the acidic form because we are in strong acid. But if I adjust my pH, and let's just go up a bit to about three-ish, pH three, now that's a little more basic than pH one. It's basic enough, still an acidic condition, but it is not acidic enough to hold the proton onto the carboxylic acid. It is 10 times less acidic than the carboxylic acid. So the carboxylic acid would be 90% in its deprotonated form here. Now, the other carboxylic acid that has a pKa of four, it is still not acidic enough to push against pH three. So pH three is more acidic than pKa 3.9, but we can change that. Let's go to pH 7. So we're now at pH 7, and at pH 7, pH 7 is way more basic than 2 or 4. And so both of these are now in their basic form, but it is not as acidic as 10. So that is still in its acidic form, but we can crank this all the way up to pH 11. There we go, we cranked it to 11. And pH 11 is basic enough to deprotonate something with a pKa of 10. This would be 90% approximately in its basic form. Now let's go back to pH 7, and we see at pH 7, this amino acid has an overall charge of minus one, minus one, that adds up to minus two, plus one, that takes us back to minus one, an overall charge of minus one. If we care only about what's happening in a peptide chain, this contributes a charge of minus one to a peptide chain at pH 7. Now all of these protonations, deprotonations at the various pHs, they're all relative to water. pH is really just telling you the strength of the acidic condition of water. So everything's relative to a standard acid, which is hydronium ion, or water itself going to hydroxide. And all of these pKa's are against water. When we say that this is a pKa of 9.8, what we mean is the equilibrium constant for this ammonium group giving up its proton to water is 10 to the minus 9.8. And this is 10 to the minus 2.1. This is a stronger acid than this. Now, if you had a boxer and you didn't know how good of a boxer he was, what you could do is you could just see how good he's doing against other boxers. And eventually maybe you would be able to connect him in a chain of boxers that boxed 
Muhammad Ali. And depending on how well he did against those boxers or those boxers did against other boxers, you'd have an idea of the relative skills of that boxer. So everything's relative. Um, if you're trying to compare two pitchers, shouldn't you be comparing them against the same batter? Well, all of these acidic and basic groups were compared against the ability of water to accept the proton. So they're all being scored against the same system. And that's what pH and pKa are. We're all in water here. What is the acid strength of hydronium ion? It's a strong acid. The pKa of hydronium ion is 10 to the 1.7. Or you could say the pKa is minus 1.7. And that's definitely in the acidic range, getting into the negative numbers. There's the proof of that if you want to go through the math. The pKa of water itself, to give up its proton, is 10 to the minus 15.7. That's a really weak acid. And there's the proof of that. So if the pKa of hydronium is 10 to the 1.7, and the pKa of water itself is 10 to the minus 15.7, there can't be any acids stronger than hydronium ion in water, because if they were, they'll just protonate water and make hydronium ion. There can't be any acids weaker than water in water, or basically their basic form, because if you put in a strong base, all it's going to do is take the proton off of water and give you hydroxide. So in water, we have those two leveling effects, if you will. We can't be, if you put in an acid that's stronger than water, all you get is hydronium ion. And that's why HCl fully dissociates. So what really is a strong acid and a weak acid? People talk about ants and how strong they are. I don't know. When I step on an ant, it doesn't lift me up, uh, but they're relatively strong. You know, an ant can lift a leaf. If that was a sheet of plywood and I was the same scale, I don't know if I'd be able to lift a sheet of plywood that size relative to me. So all of these pKa's are relative against the water reference. So if someone's talking about pKa, you're really always talking about it being against water. So the question is, how strong is your acid relative to water? Will the acid have pushed its proton out to water? Or will it have kept its proton in those conditions? pH represents the protonating power of the water solution. pKa represents the protonating power of your acid. And those are the two numbers that we compare when we ask what is strong and what is weak. So if your pKa is... Um, less than minus 1.9, or more negative than minus 1.9, and that'd be something like a strong acid here, like there, there's a pKa minus nine for HBr, that will definitely completely dissociate and just give you hydronium ion and bromide. Weak acids, though, are between pKa's of uh, minus 1.7 and 15.7. Here's a Ka of minus 3.2, the pKa would be 3.2 for that. That's a weak acid. It would just be partially dissociated in water, depending on the pH. Strong bases, of course, are always going to take a proton from water. We are more interested in that in-between world of weak acids and bases in biochemistry because we exist in water. Here is a sort of a chart of pKa values for a bunch of acids. And whether we're starting with very strong acids or with incredibly weak acids, where we would, of course, be thinking more that these are strong bases, but we're always thinking from the acid. Think from the acid side. An incredibly weak acid, the basic form is a strong base. An incredibly strong acid, the basic form must be a very weak base because it obviously does not want the proton. So here's some strong acids that we might consider. Um, HCl is a strong acid. pKa minus 6. Ka 10 to the 6. A million, right? That's a really big number. Um, in water, it would be pushing that proton against water. I can't imagine water being acidic enough to maintain HCl. You wouldn't have water anymore. You'd have a, you'd have a, uh, a mixture of HCl and water. It wouldn't be a dilute water solution anymore. Um, so strong acids fully dissociate. Hydronium ion, this is similar to hydronium ion, a protonated alcohol. It is a pKa similar to the hydronium ion, around the same value, you know, minus two, minus 1.7. So a protonated alcohol is about the same strength as acidic water, so that's kind of a tie. Let's go to the other end, strong bases. Amides are really strong bases. Sodium amide, N minus, that really wants the proton. The pKa for getting that proton onto water from an amine is 10 to the minus 35, or that's the Ka, the pKa is 35. That's an incredibly small number. So what that means is if you put sodium amide in water, it will always just take a proton from water and give you the amine and hydroxide. But we're not really interested in those extremes because life doesn't live there. 
We are interested in the middle. Consider weak acids and weak bases. Here's a weak acid. PKA 10 to the minus, or PKA of 4.7, I guess about 5, for, depending on the conditions of the uh, acetate. And so at pH 5, this would be 50% deprotonated. Um, so it's sort of a middling, sort of a weak acidic condition gets you to 50% uh, deprotonated. So that's a weak acid. A weakish basic condition, pH 8, that's, that's not very basic, but it's basic enough to make a thiol 50% deprotonated. pH 10, that's, that's basic, it's definitely basic, but it's not super strongly basic, but it is enough to get us to about 50% deprotonated in an amine. So pH is the protonating power of the water, and if it's weakly, if it's very weak, you know, pH 10, that's a 10 to the minus 10, that's a really weak protonating power, and if the Ka is at that same scale, if the pKa is 10 and the pH is 10, that's a tie, and that would be 50-50 with this equilibrium. So we kind of start in a sense that we have a scoring system here. All we really need to do is compare pH and pKa, and we can get a sense about whether we're tied or whether the pH is more acidic than the pKa, and therefore we'll be pushing the proton onto the group, or whether the pH is more basic than the pKa, and we'll be accepting the proton from the group. So in this grand scheme of things, we kind of are thinking of this sort of set of weak acids in active sites and in chemistry, in biochemistry. We'll go a little farther. We'll talk about uh, the ability to protonate alcohol groups and deprotonate alcohol groups, um, uh, at least during the reaction in a general acid or general base catalyzed manner. But for the most part, we are not talking about the extremes in biochemistry. We're talking about weak acids and weak bases. All right, so amino acids are acids. So remember, we're always talking about the acid side of things. Start with the acid. These two amino acids are in their fully acidic form. That's protonated, and that's in its protonated form. But what's the charge? Well, let's count it up. Plus one, zero, that's a total of plus one. So when these two amino acids are fully protonated, well, actually, they're both alanine. This is shown in the line diagram in sort of the uh, 3D uh, stereochemical form with the dashes indicating that that CH3 group goes into the back. Here we have the Fischer projection for the amino acid, and that tells us the exact same information as this. But we are interested in the charge. Now, I happen to know that the pK of this group is around 2, and I happen to know the pK of this group is around 10. Um, so when we're less than 2, when the solution is more acidic than 2, everything is in its acidic form. When the situation is more basic than 10, Everything is in its basic form. That's the basic form of an amine. That lone pair can accept a proton. That's the basic form of a carboxylic acid. Obviously, we can accept a proton there. In between the two, obviously, three is more acidic. Sorry, three is more basic than the carboxylic acid. But we are not basic enough to take the proton off of the amine. So I have taken the proton from the carboxylic acid, and we still have the amine. So I'm going from a charge of plus one. And as we cross from 2 to greater than 2, I am taking the proton off of the carboxylic acid. Once we're more than a full unit away, we're 90% and more in this negatively charged form. So we can say that the population is mostly in its neutral form. And it's only when we start to approach 10 that we start to significantly deprotonate the amine here and start to get us to a negative form. In all of that, we have to recognize these sort of simple rules of thumb. Should it be negative or should it be positive? That's a question I'm often asked. Well, the simplest rule to think of is just, just think of this list of things. Oxygens and sulfurs start neutral and go negative. All right, they're neutral in their acidic form, and as we move to the basic side of things, they go negative. So if you've got an oxygen group, you're only ever asking yourself, acidic form is neutral, basic form is negative. All right, so that's, the, that's oxygens and sulfurs going neutral to negative. Amines are the only atom on this list that's going from positive to neutral. Because in carboxylic acid, or sorry, in amino acids, there's oxygen groups, sulfur groups, and um, nitrogen groups. So really, nitrogen groups go positive to neutral. The other two, oxygen and sulfur, go neutral to negative. That's really all we need to know. So if you're asking yourself, it's in its acidic form, is that positive or negative? If it's a nitrogen, it's positive. The acidic form of nitrogens are positively charged. If it's an oxygen, it's neutral. The acidic form of oxygens are neutral.
how can we use this? Well, charge matters. Let's imagine starting with um, a couple of amino acids here and examine their solubility as we change charge. So here we're seeing molecular properties change with charge. Now, in strongly acidic conditions where leucine and alanine would both be positively charged, we see higher solubility than when they're neutral. And of course, if we move to a pH, much more basic pH, and start making them negatively charged, they are more soluble. But neutral amino acids are less soluble than charged amino acids. And we can see that. We can see the properties change with pH. The same goes through with serine, which, which is more polar than alanine or leucine. Um, it's more soluble than either alanine or leucine, but it has the same properties. When it's charged, it is more soluble than when it is neutral. Could we use this as a purification scheme? Could we precipitate leucine at pH 6 when serine would stay in solution? Um, is there a way to find a pH where particular proteins would precipitate and other proteins would stay in solution? So we start to see that there's a way to separate things based on at what pH they're neutral. This is something that we could exploit under various conditions. But there's a more effective way. We can use what's called an ion exchange column. This is a column of beads. So these are all like very fine beads. You're looking at a column that looks like it's filled with a, a fine powder. And each one of those beads is coated with chemistry. And that chemistry in this case is positively charged groups. I've chosen chemical groups that are positively charged pretty much no matter what the condition is. So a group that is always positively charged. So I have all these positive charges on these plastic beads or uh, cellulose beads and or I guess uh, dextran beads. That's a, a material similar to cellulose, but uh, just connected a different way. Um, so very water friendly. So water can flow all through it. Um, and so can your biomolecules, but positively charged. Now let's take three proteins. I have three proteins, and at the pH that I'm dealing with, one is neutral, one is positively charged, and one is negatively charged. What if we flush them through the column? So I'm at uh, pH 10-ish, maybe 9.7 here under these conditions, and at pH 9.7, these are the charges on my proteins. And I'm just going to put this solution through the column, and you know what? Only the negatively charged protein sticks, because it's negatively charged. The other two just pass through the column. Neutral has no interest in positive charges, and positive is repelled by positive charges. Now imagine that I had put through a whole collection of proteins, and all the neutral and positively charged proteins have been flushed out. The only thing remaining on this column are the proteins that had negative charges at pH 9.7. So they had a collection of amino acid side chains that such that at pH 7, all the charges on them totaled up to some negative value, small, large, something negative. Now I'm going to change the pH. I've put through a pH 7 buffer or pH 9.7 buffer. Now I'm going to put through a buffer solution that's, that's more like pH 7.5. Look what happened at pH 7.5. At pH 7.5, there was a couple of proteins here that were neutral or positively charged at pH 7.5. Remember, pH 7.5 is more acidic than pH 9.7. So protons are starting to get pushed onto groups. In these, proton, in these proteins. These proteins are negatively charged, but they're probably less negatively charged than they were. Protons are getting pushed onto them as we cross the pKa values of various groups. But these two proteins happened to cross the line. They went from negative to neutral or even positive. And what happened to them? Flush. They're not going to stick to the column anymore. They're going to leave. So I have separated away proteins that switched their charge as I went to pH 7.5. Now I've got less proteins on the column. Those two proteins that came off, they've been collected in a test tube. Now I'm gonna change the pH from 7.5 to 6.5. Under those conditions, one of the proteins, this one right here, has switched its charge. And maybe, just maybe, that's the protein I'm interested in. If that is the protein that I'm interested in, isn't this perfect that it is the one protein that's coming off with this small change in conditions? So away it goes, and I've got a test tube waiting for it. I have now purified that protein, if I'm lucky enough that it's the one protein that comes out under these conditions. And then I can recover my column by cranking the pH down even further, um, making sure that every protein is gonna be positively charged or neutral, and we just flush away everything we don't want. 
So we have a batch of proteins that came off ahead of the protein we wanted. We have the protein we wanted because we knew the pH at which it would come off. And we have the rest. And we can throw those out and keep the one protein we want. And so I can use the changing charge on proteins as we change pH to separate them into batches according to the pH at which they came off the column. Now, this all hinges on when your protein is zero charged. And a good model for when a protein is zero charged is when an amino acid is a zero charge. All our amino acids have multiple charge groups. If you've got only two groups, you're really just dealing with the two values of the pKa. Here I have alanine uh, pKa of two takes us from plus one to zero in total charge. Crossing pKa of 10 took us from zero to minus one. So somewhere between two and 10, we're perfectly zero. We're mostly zero between, you know, between three and nine, the population of alanine is mostly zero. But we are exactly zero halfway between these two pKa values. So really, you just have to take the average of them. Take the average of the two pKa values that take you across zero. All right, from plus one to zero, that's one pKa value. From zero to minus one, that's the other pKa value. Find those two and only two. There can be only two. Take the two and divide by two. There will always be two under this. Never three, only two. So take the two and average them. And of course, here you see that the isoelectric point, PI, for this amino acid is six. Now, we're not so much caring about isoelectric points of individual amino acids. We care about proteins, but this is a great way to introduce you to the concept. We know the pKa values for amino acids. They've been uh, thoroughly investigated um, by other researchers. But look, most amino acid side chains aren't ionizable. So most amino acids just have the two pKa's of their uh, head group, the carboxylic acid and the amine that are on the alpha carbon. So most amino acids, you just average those two numbers. Notice 2.33, 9.71 gave us a isoelectric point of six. You'll notice the electric points of amino acids are mostly around six because that's pretty much the average of a carboxylic acid and an amine at the alpha carbon. Now, some amino acids, of course, have a different side chain than just a methyl or something that can't be ionized. Take histidine. Histidine in its fully protonated form, remember amines in their fully protonated form, in their acid form are positively charged. So po nitrogen positive, nitrogen positive, oxygen neutral when fully protonated. Positive, positive, plus two, neutral, zero. We're still at plus two. So the charge is plus two. And as I move up in, in making the pH more and more basic, I cross the pKa values. The first pKa I cross is for the carboxylic acid. Uh, it's now in its basic form. Total charge is one. The next one is takes us to zero, one to zero, zero to one. These are the two values, the six and the nine. One to zero, zero to one. What two values did that? The six and the nine, their average is 7.5. Now, if you start with an oxygen group, like a carboxylic acid in the side chain, then its acid uh, form is neutral. So I have neutral plus and neutral, so plus one. I'm starting at plus one. And plus one to zero, zero to minus one. These are the two values we're talking about when we talk about the isoelectric point of um, uh, aspartic acid. So um, we're going from two and four. Four was the side chain carboxylic acid, right? That took us, to zero, that took us from zero to minus one. So plus one to zero, zero to minus one. Just look up the two numbers that did that. Two and four. Really, if you know the initial charge of your uh, amino acid, if you know it starts at plus two, you just have to go by notches. Plus two, plus one. All right, so it's the next two. One to zero, zero to one, six and nine. Starting at plus one, we know we're already going to go to zero and then minus one. So you take the first two pKa's. Let's start with something else. Here's a, a lysine. Of course, it's got two amine groups. It's starting at the charge of plus two. So I know I got to go one notch before I have to start worrying about plus one to zero and zero to minus one. So I'm taking the later two pKa's here, nine and 11. And really the rule of thumb is gonna be if it's an oxygen or a sulfur group, take the first two pKa's in the list. 
the two lowest values and average them. If it's a nitrogen group in the side chain, take the last two pKa's and average them. If it's not an ionizable side chain, take the only two pKa's and average them. It's just that simple. Let's do one more. This is cysteine. It's a sulfur. Take the first two, but here's the proof. The first two are the ones that take you from plus one to zero and zero to minus one. And the first two in the list are two and eight. So just rank them in order and take the first two for sulfur and oxygen in the side chain, rank them in order and take the last two if there's a nitrogen in the side chain and that will give you the isoelectric point for any amino acid. Um, so let's take a look here. Histidine, that's a nitrogen. Take the last two, nine and six. The average is 7.5-ish, right? Um, let's look at the next one. Aspartic acid, that's an oxygen. Take the first two, 1.95 and 3.71 are the lowest two. And there's your average. Uh, lysine, take the last two. Cysteine, take the first two. So just remember that rule. Now remember, the individual amino acid isoelectric points don't matter so much. What's the isoelectric point of this polypeptide here? I don't know. Number one, the pKa's of these groups will change a little bit based on the fact that they're next to other charges. If two lysines are next to each other on a, a primary sequence, they'll have a different pKa than if they were far apart from each other. Are they next to a negative charge? Um, so I have no clue what the, iso the true isoelectric point of this uh, small peptide chain is. How would you know? Well, why don't you just ask it? One way you can ask a protein what its isoelectric point is, is to do an isoelectric focusing gel. And here's where we get back to our fish. An electrophoresis gel is a gel that resists protein motion, but if I apply a electric field, I will force a protein through that gel. If it's negatively charged, it'll move toward the positive end. If it's positively charged, it'll move toward the negative end, and it will be forced through the gel. But I can arrange for that gel to have a pH gradient. I can buy commercial gels, Better to buy it than to make it, but it can be made. Uh, I can buy a commercial gel that has a steady changing pH from between like 3 and 10. This, this particular gel changes between 3 and 10. And the pH in the gel is 3.5 here. The pH in the gel is 9.3 here. If the isoelectric point of a protein is, say, 5.2, that means at pH 7.3, which is way more basic than 5.2, will have less protons than we would otherwise. They have given them up to the basic system, so it's negatively charged. So it moves toward the positive electrode. It keeps moving toward the positive electrode. But of course, remember, its isoelectric point is 5.2. At pH 5.2, ding, it's neutral. It won't move anymore. Wherever it started in the gel, if you dumped it here in pH 4-ish, it's now positively charged because that's more acidic than its isoelectric point. It'll move toward the negative end until, ding, it's here. So if I put a sample of, P of proteins in the middle of this gel, they would just all move according to their charge until they found the pH at which they were neutral, and the pH at which they are neutral is their isoelectric point. So whatever this protein is here, I know its isoelectric point is 5.85. More importantly, I already knew that. These proteins here are a, a, a ladder of standards. I bought a batch of proteins where they knew I had a protein in that batch. They put one in there that they knew it had an isoelectric point of 3.5. They knew there was one with an isoelectric point of 6.55. They chose the proteins that went into this batch to make sure I had a good distribution. So when I do my isoelectric focusing experiment and run the uh, machine, uh, put the charge on, run it for a few hours, um, and let everything settle down to where it needs to go, everything eventually gets to the point where it moves no longer. What if I put an unknown batch of proteins on there, like proteins from the muscle of a codfish? I just, take, I just take that meat from the supermarket, grind it up, and throw it on. Well, these proteins, you just run it for a few hours, and eventually everything settles to the point at which everything is stationary. Whatever this protein is right here, it has an isoelectric point just under 5.85. Whatever this protein is right here, it has an isoelectric point just over 5.85. What matters is it's kind of like a fingerprint. That is what the muscle proteins of codfish look like when they're run on an isoelectric focusing experiment. Now, codfish is expensive. They're rare. Hell, we, we, we've almost killed them all off. You know what's a cheaper fish because it's more plentiful? Cusk. But someone might be trying to sell that to you as codfish. How could an inspector know that that white meat is cod or cusk? Well, you could just do this quick isoelectric focusing gel. There's cusk. Does that look different than cod? Let's compare the two. Whoa, that is different. 
you can see that there are differences. This protein here is much more prevalent in cusk than in cod. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. This could actually be the same protein as this protein. It's just that it has you know, one or two different amino acids in difference and therefore a different charge. So the isoelectric pattern of cod and cusk, the, the isoelectric point of specific proteins is a little different in cusk than cod and can be easily spotted. And so isoelectric point matters. It lets us separate proteins according to their isoelectric point. And of course, if you knew the isoelectric point of a protein, then you could know the exact pH at which to work with on the ion exchange column. Uh, start a little below, you know, what is this one here? Let's call it four-ish. Start a little below four, move to a little above four. We'll take all the proteins off that, uh, you know, and then we cross this one, take that one off, collect it, sell it, make money, and then we can sweep the rest off by taking the pH up. Um, so isoelectric point matters in separating proteins, and we'll have a lot more to discuss about separating proton proteins later on in the course. So as you consider this lecture, consider these essential skills. You need to be able to use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation to determine the ratio of ionization for an amino acid. And as you do more and more of these, you'll quickly recognize that when pH equals pKa, this ratio is one to one. If there's a one unit difference between pH and pKa, this ratio is going to be 1 to 10 or 10 to 1, depending on which direction you're going. And once you're past that, 2, 3, 4, we're at 100 to 1, 1,000 to 1, or basically done, right? Um, so be able to use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. Be able to take a table of isoelectric points for an amino acid, or a pKa values for an amino acid, and calculate the isoelectric point. Uh, glycine, only two values. Average them, right? Tyrosine. Three values. I know it's an oxygen on the side chain. So take the first two. Take the lowest two. Two point something and nine point something. The average is five and a half, right? Um, so understand those rules. Be able to understand what isoelectric points in proteins mean, right? It's the point at which that protein is neutral. That could be the point at which it crystallizes best. If you're trying to get a crystal of a protein, for a crystal structure, maybe use a pH value that's close to its isoelectric point, assuming that doesn't alter its structure. And have a general sense of the relative strengths of weak uh, acids. Know that a carboxylic acid is a stronger acid than an amidazole, and that uh, an amine is a really weak acid, meaning, of course, that the amine is what we consider to be a base. So this is just the beginning of your review of acid-base chemistry as, as it relates to amino acids. Uh, we're going to do some exercises in class about this uh, in the tutorial. Um, and you need to sort of practice this and play with it and consider these questions as you're thinking um, uh, about this subject. This lecture is just uh, an aperitif. It's just a little sip before the meal. And enjoy the tasting notes on our aperitif of the day, this aquavit. Um, which is a, uh, uh, basically a distilled spirit uh, infused with dill or, uh, for flavor um, and uh, uh, with the aqua in the name because we've been talking about water for the past few classes. So remember, we're just starting. The rest is up to you. Uh, I hope you will take advantage of the opportunity to learn more and explore more about acid-base chemistry and how it practically applies to proteins, their structure, their function, and their separation. So if you want to check out the references, they're on the next page. Thank you for your time. is a codfish, one of these is a cusk. In the supermarket, both of these meats are just going to be 
white finch. Are you getting the cod you paid for? <laughs>